Okay, so muscle groups. This is another way that you can characterize muscles. So as we are well aware, muscles, and in particular skeletal muscles, move joints. And we've already hit on the different types of joint movement when we were discussing skeletal system. And now we're adding in this next layer of complexity being muscles. And the muscle is actually what's going to facilitate force to generate the movement. And when we do this, we actually are going to have several muscles that are going to be required to accomplish the task and other muscles that are actually going to oppose or reverse a particular task. So several muscles are required to accomplish a specific task. And when I say task, I'm talking things like elbow flexion and elbow extension. Those would be the tasks that we are discussing here. So several muscles are required to accomplish things like elbow flexion or elbow extension. Because it's several muscles and not just an individual muscle, these can be considered cooperative relationships. And we are going to have cooperative efforts within these cooperative relationships. Now, the task, such as elbow flexion, is going to be known as the muscle's action. So known as the muscle's action. So there's going to be a muscle that flexes the elbow, and it will be an elbow flexor, and that will be its action. Now, in these cooperative relationships, we're going to have up to four different types of muscles. This is not to be confused with four individual muscles, but four types of muscles. that'll impute a muscle's action. In other words, to raise my hand up to drink a glass of water, I have to coordinate this task with four different, up to four different types of muscles, and then each type there may actually be multiple individual muscles included in that type. So one of the muscles that's going to be involved is going to be an agonist. The agonist is such named because it is the primary mover of a joint. The primary mover of a joint. To be the primary mover, the thing that you need to do is impute the largest amount of force for that collective action. So we can impute the largest amount of force. So this example here, we're trying to raise a glass of water. Maybe we're taking a drink or maybe we're putting out the fire that we just gargled. And the muscle that's going to impute the largest amount of force here is actually going to be biceps breaking up. So those are going to be our primary movers or our agonistic muscles, our agonists. But we actually have to stabilize the joint. So as I move that muscle, all of that force that's being generated by biceps brachii yeah, can go into moving the elbow joint and is not going into maintaining the position of the elbow so that it's able to go through that motion. Okay, so I'm going to stabilize the joint, and that's going to come through both the synergist as well as 
a muscle that's known as the fixator. And I'm going to get to the fixator in just a few minutes here. But um, the synergist is going to be the helper. We'll add a little bit of force, but we'll also stabilize. By adding force and then in particular by stabilizing the joint, we're preventing unwanted movement or rotation. In other words, the center just helps the agonist to be able to fix as much of the force on that movement as possible without causing any sort of unwanted rotation, removing force that's being generated. Removes it from the, prevents it from being removed from that primary movement. So over here, the synergist is going to be brachio, brachio radialis. Notice we're also going to have brachialis, which is underneath or deep to biceps. It's going to act as a synergist in this example as well. So our primary mover, our primary mover or our agonist is biceps brachii, and then two synergists, brachioradialis and brachialis are both going to help to stabilize and add force towards elbow flexion. The antagonist is going to be a muscle that opposes the movement. So if we're talking about elbow flexion, we're going to have a muscle that opposes elbow flexion. In this case, it's going to be triceps brachialis. Uh, I call it triceps brachialis. I'm in triceps brachii. Excuse me. So triceps brachii is going to oppose the movement. Now, the synergist and the primary mover in this example, we could call them flexors because they flex the elbow. The opposing movement is going to be extension. And so triceps brachii is a uh, extensor that opposes the flexors. No. Can you explain that? Flexors, okay, like... Oppose, are opposed, I guess I... What are flexors and what are ex Flexors oppose extensors. Flexors reduce the joint angle. Extensors are going to oppose the reduction of joint angle. Oh, okay. They would increase joint angle. But if I'm increasing joint angle, that's extension. And so now I'm going to have to reorganize. Extension, my primary mover, my agonist is triceps brachii. <coughs> my antagonist is biceps brachii. My synergist is going to be things um, like, um, yeah, um, flexor digiti minimi, some of those forearm muscles that help to stabilize that joint. So flexors oppose extensors, and then if we go to explaining extension or describing extension, all of this flips around, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, in addition to opposing the movement, the antagonist is actually more involved than just opposing the movement. It's actually going to stop the muscle movement at the appropriate angle. So it restricts some of the movement. I can only move my arm so far because I stretched biceps brachii. 
It is also going to stabilize the joint. It will help to oppose unwanted movement. of the agonist. So the biceps could actually begin to roll over on my arm. Biceps brachii is going to help to stabilize that to prevent that movement from occurring. This relationship between the agonist and the antagonist produces what is known as an antagonistic pair with the agonist. And ultimately, it is going to undo the action imputed. So undoes the action of the other muscle. So if it's the example of elbow flexion, triceps brachii break, break, will undo the flexion in the process that we call extension. Now, when we look at muscles, if I extend the muscle, let's say I inhibit triceps brachii, how do I undo my muscle? How do I undo flexion here? So I no longer have triceps brachii. Yeah, I've inhibited it. How do I relax? Okay, relax the bicep. Is that going to really do it? Don't you have to pull down with something on? Yeah, you have to always impute some sort of force, and the reason that is is because. Muscles only pull. There are no muscles that push. And when you relax your muscle, so right now my muscle is contracted and now it's relaxed, well, my arm is not going to go back. Even though there's no longer any contraction that's occurring, the only way it's going to go back is if we put out some sort of force using because of contraction of another muscle. So muscles only pull, no pushing. What does that say in A? Undoes the action of the other. Now there's one last uh, type of muscle that sometimes can be involved in um, muscle action, and that's a fixator. And the fixator is actually going to be a bone stabilizer. So remember that when I flex, where is my proximal attachments for biceps brachii? So glenoid cavity and coracoid process. I have to fix the shoulder in place. And so I'm going to have additional muscles. The deltoid is going to be one of them that will help to stabilize and fix this bone in place. So as I begin to flex the muscle, really I, I'm pulling up on the forearm, but I'm also pulling down on the shoulder when I flex the muscle, right? It's not just because this is what's moving doesn't mean that's the only place force is actually being applied. It's just like tug of war. If Paige and I were to play tug of war, she'd be pulling on the rope and imputing force in, in that direction, and I'd be pulling on it and imputing force in this direction. And if I had, you know, if I was tethered up to the wall, I would be fixed, and I would be able to move her. As soon as that happens, she's much stronger than me, and we would probably both kind of move back and forth, right? So I got to fix one of those locations. So that as the muscle applies its force, all of that force that's being generated can go towards the task. And that comes from these muscles that are referred to as fixators. These are another bone stabilizing 
muscle that we find in, involved in the muscle task. In addition to stabilizing the bone, it allows other muscles that are attached to that bone to function. So over here on this side, I got the scapula. And over on this side, I have muscles that attach into parts of my back. And if every time I went to flex my arm, if these muscles no longer could work, I would lose that muscle tension and I would just slump over and have very little function. So by stabilizing this joint here, by stabilizing this part of the, uh, of the muscle, this bone, in that relationship, all the force can be applied here. And I can still use other bones and other muscles to actually do other tasks. So kind of the net result here, or the outcome of the fixator is the intended bone of movement. The bone that I want to move is going to be the bone that is moved. So the intended bone of movement is the bone that's moved. Now, if every time I flexed my arm, if I didn't have my fixator here, what if every time I flexed, it caused the, the um, shoulder to come in towards my, towards my elbow? So I moved in both directions. I moved this way, but I also moved this way. I would lose force production. So by in, uh, having the intended bone of movement being the only bone that's moving, I'm going to have very little force that's lost due to the bone movement elsewhere, to bone moving, movement elsewhere. Okay, so a lot of muscles involved in something very simple as elbow flexion. There are two more things that I really want to talk about when we're characterizing individual muscles. One of them is going to be how the muscle is innervated, where it gets its nervous system supply, and then the other one is just going to be its blood supply. We're going to start out with innervation. And the muscles of the body, the skeletal muscles of the body, are going to be innervated in two different ways. And they're going to be innervated in these two ways based off of where they're located. In the head, we're actually going to have cranial innervation. Everything else, we're going to have spinal or peripheral innervation. So innervation for muscles of the head Oops. which you can see here, we have and we're going to learn these later on this semester. We have nerves that extend directly from the brain, and those are called cranial nerves. So you'll learn these cranial nerves. You're going to learn that nomenclature a little bit later. There are actually 12 different cranial nerves, and some of them are going to go in, and they're going to innervate muscles here in the face, muscles for eye movement, muscles for facial expression. So these particular nerves, the cranial nerves, these are nerves that extend directly from the base of the brain. Now, from the base of the brain, the brain is contained within the cranium, the skull, basically. The case is going to be the cranium. 
We have to get those cranial nerves out. What do you think they come out of? For a minute. So the cranial nerves pass through those skull foramen. Most of them are actually going to be foramina, the small, tiny foramen. And they will have contact with those muscles in the brain. And, and we'll come back and we'll talk about what that small area where nerve and muscle tissue contact, we're going to talk about that. It's called the, uh, it's called the neuromuscular junction. And we'll discuss neuromuscular junction here once we start talking about muscle tissue. So all of this here is from cranial nerves. So if we want to move our eyes, we're getting eye movement from ocular, ocular motor. That's the cranial nerve that helps us to move our eyes. Then we have all of the other muscles in the body. And for this class, the definition of all the other muscles in the body, we're just going to say from the neck below. Okay, so both the limbs, upper and lower limbs, and the trunk. These are actually going to uh, be nerves that extend off of the spinal column or the spinal cord. So the muscles of the body, the neck and below, or below the neck, are innervated by spinal nerves. And these nerves are going to branch off the spinal column. And they are going to cross or pass from the spinal column into the periphery. Well, anyone happen to know where they're, how they're going to get into the body? They're going to pass through... You know what the specific foramen is? Interventricular foramen? Uh, did I say interventricular? Yeah. That's the septum of the heart. <laughs> <laughs> Intervertebral foramen. the intervertebral foramen. And that's what you're looking at here is basically these spinal nerves that are extending away from the spinal cord, and you would have the individual vertebrae surrounding this area. And coming out of the intervertebral foramen, you're going to have those spinal nerves. Now, as the spinal nerve leaves the intervertebral foramen, it forms a bifurcation. So we're going to form this bifurcation or basically a division. And what you can see here, this division, you're going to have a anterior body and a posterior body. better way to say body is ramus or ramus. So leaving the Spinal column, you have an anterior ramus and a posterior ramus. And these lead into a web-like structure that's known as the plexus or plexes. And you have the brachial plexus and the cervical plexus and the lumbar plexus. And then eventually you'll have individual spinal nerves that run down to certain regions and certain muscles within the organism. And then again, you're going to have the um, connection between the nerve and the muscle, 
called a neuromuscular junction. And we're going to take a look at that shortly. Does everybody have all of this? So from the anterior ramus and the posterior ramus, the nerves form these additional web-like divisions, which are plexes or plexus, it would be the singular. And these are eventually going to lead towards specific regions of the body. And you'll have individual spinal nerves that innervate individual muscle cells within each muscle. We are most certainly coming back to all of this. We're going to come back to the nervous system um, maybe two weeks from now, and we'll revisit all of this. But just suffice it to say that spinal nerves make their way through posterior anterior ramus into the plexus, plexus service, an individual area of the body. Brachial plexus obviously is going to send spinal uh, nerves down into the muscles of the arms and the hands and forms neuromuscular junctions with individual muscle fibers or muscle cells. Okay, the last thing I want to characterize here is the blood supply. Because the blood supply for muscles is really, really pretty unique. So think about it. A muscle has to extend and has to contract. And it changes size. And that means that the blood supply also has to change size. Imagine that the blood supply was a lot like this cord here. And let's say that it was only one distance or one length and couldn't adjust with size. What would happen if I extend it and rip it apart. So every time you extended the muscle or contra uh, relaxed the muscle and contracted another muscle and caused the whole muscle to lengthen, you would rip apart that capillary supply. So the capillary blood supply that leads into a muscle is going to have to be very, very unique. Blood supply is very important for muscle because muscle it's actually defined or is actually said to be the metabolic tissue of the human body or the metabolic tissue of mammals. And that's because of a very high number of metabolic reactions that are required in order for muscle to in order for muscle to survive or to be fully functional. When you, when you put muscle, do you mean that muscle blood supply increase? No, no, no. So we're going to talk about blood supply, but before we can get to blood supply, we have to identify that blood supply is very important for muscle because muscle itself is a highly metabolic tissue, high metabolic activity in muscle. There's many, many chemical reactions occurring to maintain the physiological function of a muscle. It's going to be our blood supply that brings in the raw nutrients so those chemical reactions can continue and perpetuate. Okay, muscle fiber. What does that term refer to? The individual muscle fiber. What level of detail are we talking about? What's that? Pager? Nope. Just tissue. Yeah, so muscle fibers would, there would be many muscle fibers in a facet. I think I'm just from now on going to put ER and all in at the end of all of your names. What did you ask? Ashley Ear. Fascia. What is an individual muscle fiber? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe you have it. What is a muscle fiber? This is a term that we use. So if you don't understand this. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> muscle fiber is muscle cell. Oh, that's what you wanted. Don't even try to play off. No, I thought you I knew that, but you just didn't ask the question, right? <laughs> I thought you wanted to name like what a muscle fiber is called. Cell! That's what I wanted! <laughs> <laughs> muscle fiber and muscle cell are equivalent. Okay, so when I say an individual muscle fiber, I'm talking about at the level of the muscle cell. Each individual muscle cell or muscle fiber is going to have their own capillary. So if we get, go and dig into a muscle and we count that there are 100,000 muscle cells in this particular muscle, we should expect 100,000 capillaries, each one for one with their own muscle cell. Now, we have to accommodate for contraction and extension of the muscle. And so these capillaries, and that's what you can see illustrated here. Notice they look like they're real wavy. What that is and what you're observing there is those capillaries have coils. Now, I know that you probably have seen this maybe a long time ago because everybody has cell phones now. But do you remember when phones actually used to attach to the wall? Yeah. And you had the big long coil and you'd like, if you were a girl, you'd like answer the phone. It was in the kitchen and you'd like try to get over to your room. <laughs> And your parents would like follow the cord. Remember that? <laughs> so that's what this actually looks like. These capillaries are coiled, and so they can stretch out like that foam cord. And then when the muscle flexes, they recoil. So the capillaries are not just a tube, they're going to be this coiled tube that can increase and decrease in length in response to muscle contraction and extension. So it's like a telephone cord. And we're going to see the coils in the flexed state. So when the muscle is flexed, the coils get pushed into or uh, occur inside the capillary, and the capillary coils up. And then as you extend, that slat comes out and accommodates for the movement. And so we have that slack to allow the capillary to move with extension and flexion and not break. Now it's very important that it's the coil. Remember what those old telephone cords used to do? You'd pull them out. And then you'd release them and they'd coil back up. What if, have, that, have any of you seen a uh, phone? Some of them used to just have just like a straight cord and they weren't coiled. And so you'd stretch it out and you'd drop it and what would it do? It didn't coil back up. It would just lay there where it was, right? So by having it coiled, it's actually going to rebound. If it wasn't coiled, if it didn't have that coil structure, this is really great design. Because if it didn't have that, then every time you flexed or um, decreased muscle length, it would just kind of flop out. And it probably would occlude, it would reduce blood flow into the muscle, but by having it coiled, it responds and stays right where it needs to stay and it continues to supply blood. Would a coil not give blood flow across the problem? They prevent the problems that we would have with blood flow. Okay. All right, the last thing that we need to identify here that we need to discuss. There are a lot of muscles that you need to know. In fact, there are about 100 and 145 individual muscles on your sheet. Mm -hmm. And there's like 600 in the human body. 
Not obviously some of them have repeats because you have bicep and bicep. But still, there's 600 muscles, individual muscles in the human body, uh, roughly. So I'm just going to briefly give you a little bit of strategy. That's supposed to be specimen course, isn't it? When did that really <laughs> strategy. How are we going to learn all of the muscles that we need to know? So tip number one. <laughs> tip number one is to practice, practice, practice. That's not a tip. <laughs> yes, you are going to need to study these and you're going to need to engage this material frequently and often. Now, your book has some suggestions. And I'd suggest you take a look in there. One of the most useful things the book is going to do for you is there's plenty of really nice pictures, or what they would call plates. Okay? And you can take a look at just the arm muscles, the muscles that we find in the arm. Now, if I can give you one piece of wisdom to help in this process, it's to learn the naming convention. And what that means is learn how muscles get their name, or what we would call nomenclature. In many of our muscles, are going to be named for their characteristics. And we've talked a little bit about some of these characteristics. So they might get a name or a portion of their name based off of their structure or their shape. name of a muscle might partially be dictated by their location. And then many muscles are actually going to be identified based off of what they do, or what we would call the action of the muscle. Okay, so this is kind of like reading a map. If you don't know what a road is, it's going to be really hard to find a road on a map or at least the symbology for a road. Or if I'm like, yeah, can you go find the dirt trail that leads up to Yona Mountain, or Mount Yona, whatever you want to call it? If you don't know what the symbol is for a dirt road, and you don't know what the symbol is for a mountain, you're probably going to be hosed. So you kind of, kind of have to know what the map says. And the map for muscles is going to be based off of structure and shape, location, and action of muscles. Now, this is not necessarily a hard and fast rule. There's going to be some uh, muscles that don't really follow any of this. One of them that I can think of is a muscle in the leg called sartorius. In addition to the names of muscles being based off of their characteristics, it's going to be helpful to know a little bit of Latin. So Latin roots are also useful. And the last thing that I think is going to help you is you can read a muscle, and if you can pull that muscle's name apart, 
you might actually be able to find that muscle, which is based off of how the name is pulled apart or how you can parse the name. Okay, so maybe you've already started studying, studying some of these muscles, and so maybe this is going to be pretty easy. But there is a muscle that is called frontalis. Anyone have any idea where that muscle is going to be? And why is it right here? Because that's where my frontal bone is, that's where my frontal lobe is of my brain. So the muscle that is located near the frontal bone makes a lot of sense that we might call it frontalis. All right, let's try a little bit harder one here. Flexor digitorum profundus. So there are three things in this name that are going to be beneficial. The first is the flexor. Okay, so it's going to it's going to reduce joint angle. So that's an action. So this particular muscle, if I literally just read this, this is going to be a muscle that flexes, flexor. What's it flexing? Digitorum, which is the digits, and we're going to go with the fingers. So flexor digitorum. So what are my options? Where might I find this? Where might I find this muscle? It's flexing. So is it going to be on the back side of the arm? It's probably going to be someplace here. So look what you just done. It's flexor digitorum profundus. It's somewhere in here. Right? Someplace in the body. But it flexes the fingers. So we've gone from 603 possible muscles in the whole body to a handful of muscles in the forearm. Now, it's going to be flexor digitorum profundus. So this flexes the fingers. Notice it's not something just flexing something like the thumb. So it's flexing all of the fingers. Okay? So tendon for flexor digitorum profundus. It's going to attach up to the fingers. You're going to see a tendon that attaches up all of the fingers. Now, the last thing that we have here is profundus. What does profundus actually mean? Profundus, give me another word that kind of sounds like profundus. Profound. And what is profound? Deep. And a way to remember this is I am so deep to speak profound wisdom. <laughs> Flexes the finger, and it's the deepest of the finger flexors. So just based off of flex, flexor digitorum profundus, you're looking at, let's say I give you, um, give you a picture, and I have all of these other muscles reflected away, and you got just one muscle here. What muscle is it? Well, it's on the forearm, and it's attached up to all of the fingers. It's a flexor attached to all the other fingers, and it's really deep. Flexor to the forearm for us. When you say deep, do you mean deep as in I mean, deep deep as you have to pull away a whole bunch of tissue to get down to it. Yeah. As opposed to superficialis. Because we also have a flexor digitorum superficialis. And it's going to look very similar to flexor digitorum profundus, but it's going to be up towards the surface. Flexor digitorum minimi, what do you think that's going to do? 
flexor, digitorum, minimi. Digitorum minimi. Digitorum oh. minimi. <laughs> so it's going to be the finger flexor that moves by minimi or my smallest finger. <laughs> 